Hey, Adam here, and welcome back. In Australia, there's a mountain known as the Black Mountain, and perhaps fittingly located in the Black Mountain National Park. It's said that the local Aboriginal tribes shun the area and describe it as a place that people shouldn't venture. They called the mountain Kalkajaka, or the place of the spear, and it looks like they did this because they associated the mountain with very negative occurrences and outcomes for some of the people who travelled to this place, namely, not returning. You can find some of the beliefs of the Aboriginals who basically state that they believe that not so well intentioned spirits live inside the rocks and the boulders of the mountain. What's particularly interesting here too is that European colonists also seem to have added to the natives' folklore with odd reported occurrences of their own. While researching about the mountain, similar to the native folklore, the European colonists spoke of many of their horses and cows straying into the mountain area, only to never be able to locate them again. It's also been said that some of these trips to find the animals didn't end well either, and some of the people looking also never came back. Now thankfully, and touch wood and all that, I haven't come across any recent disappearances on the mountain, but there does seem to be quite a lot of disappearances that have been reported on in the past, among other general weirdness. The first incident I could find that received press attention was the disappearance of an old miner called Jimmy Wren, and this was in May of 1892. Jimmy ascended the Black Mountain to look for gold, but this particular trip seems to have been different from the others, and something must have gone awry because he never came back down. He'd been staying in the Joyce Hotel in Cocktown with a friend of his, and they were on business there. Later, they found themselves in a wayside tavern at Trevithan Creek, and they rested there a while. Jimmy was ready to move on, but his friend had been drinking, and they agreed to split up and meet at a hotel called Helen Vale. As you might imagine, when Jimmy's friend eventually made it to Helen Vale, Jimmy was nowhere to be seen. So somewhere in this vast land of rocks and boulders, Jimmy disappeared. Inspector Fitzgerald was the person who led the search effort for James, and he told the police commissioner that their search had ended in absolute failure. James had disappeared not far from the Annan River, and Fitzgerald had people searching all over the mountain and up and down the river. Unfortunately, when they couldn't find a trace of him, no directional indicators, uh, no clothes or equipment or anything of that nature, Fitzgerald started to believe that James's disappearance was intentional, presumably because he felt that they should have found something. He then told the commissioner that he considered further searches useless. The friend, among others in the area, disagreed with this assessment, and from what I can gather, Jimmy was very well thought of, and none of them believed that this was intentional. However, they couldn't come up with any theories that made more sense. There's an odd quote from an article on this, written back in February of 1933. This is by the Brisbane Courier. The cry was raised. Settlers, farmers, packers, miners, they all came from all over the district. And the natives joined the search which was kept up for three weeks. It was a local sensation, a mystery that all were determined to solve. But Jimmy Wren had vanished completely. Between Trevathan and Helen Vale, only a few miles, he had disappeared, leaving no sign to guide the keenest trackers on Earth, the Aborigines. It does seem as though people were shocked and taken aback by this. It looks like they were surprised that the Aboriginal trackers couldn't find a single track or trace of him. And despite almost 130 years passing since then now, Jimmy, not any sign of him, has ever been found or recovered. Now, I came across an article by Australia's ABC News, which briefly spoke about some other historic disappearances on the Black Mountain. Here are a few that they briefly highlighted. In circa 1800, notorious criminal Sugarfoot Jack and his accomplices flee to Black Mountain following an exchange of projectiles. They were never seen again, despite an exhaustive search. July 1872, a courier named Philip Grainer goes out looking for his stray calf. He, his horse, and the calf never return. November 1882, two cattlemen, Harry Owens and George Hawkins, disappear while looking for stray cattle around Black Mountain, as does one of the police trackers searching for the missing men. A second tracker returns completely unhinged and unable to provide a coherent report. 1890, Constable Ryan tracks a fugitive to a cave at Black Mountain. He enters to see if the fugitive might be hiding inside. According to those present, he never came back out. 
I came across an article by the Sunday Mail, wrote in January of 1934, which reported a couple of these incidents in more detail. Early one Sunday morning in November 1882, Harold Owens, a well-known and popular settler of the Oakey Creek District, several miles west of Cooktown, left his farm on horseback to search the Black Mountain country for some horses he had lost. A few hours later, he was seen heading for the mountain by a carrier who was travelling along the Palmer River Road, and that was the last that was ever seen or heard of Owens and his horse. In this case, the police and Aborigine trackers, assisted by hundreds of friends of the Owens family, made an exhaustive search of the mountain and a vast area of country in the vicinity, but again, no trace of the missing man was found. Owens and his horse had completely vanished. The search parties had just given up the search when yet another man was reported to have disappeared at the mountain. This was George Hawkins, a well-known person of the Four Mile District outside Cooktown. This is important because the ABC article made it sound like Harold and George disappeared together, but there was about a month in between the two disappearances. Quite literally, the search for Harold had just ended when George also disappeared and the searchers were once again out and looking. Continuing on. George had a club foot, and one fine morning in December 1882, he left the Four Mile District and rode towards the Black Mountain, in order to ascertain whether there was any feed for cattle in the locality. He had been talking about taking up some land in the vicinity. Hawkins, of course, knew all about the mysterious disappearances, but he took little notice of them, and declared that the men must have got lost somewhere which was hardly feasible since both of the missing men were experienced bushmen. At any rate, Hawkins proceeded along the Palmer River Road where he met several travellers. He spoke to one of these near the mountain and mentioned that he was visiting the country around the strange hill. As the traveller continued on his way, he looked back and saw Hawkins leave the road and ride in the direction of the mountain. And that was the last that was ever seen or heard of Hawkins or his horse. These two disappearances, and the fact that absolutely nothing was turning up at all created a local sensation, in that everyone in the area was absolutely determined to figure out what had happened. After George went missing, even more people turned up to search. Harold, nor George, has ever been found, nor any bones or anything like that. The Aboriginal trackers had said in both instances that there was no evidence of foul play or animal predation, which brings us to an interesting quote. The official verdict in both cases was disappeared at Black Mountain, but the natives' verdict was that they were eaten up altogether by Debel Debel. Unsurprisingly, I suppose, I've never actually heard of that term before, but according to Oxford languages, it's an evil spirit in Aboriginal belief. If you've seen my video on the hidden people, there'll be a link to this in the top right now, this might sound oddly familiar. They would then gather them all up and take them home. Children cook the bardies when they get home. After four o'clock, they must not go chasing the bardies. They wouldn't be allowed. They reckon these devil devil will take them away. That is a little bully it man. As soon as the sun goes down, he starts edging them off and taking them away. I have no idea what bardies are. Noongar though refers to a person of southwest of Western Australia, or rather, the name of the original inhabitants of the southwest of Western Australia, and from what I can gather, are the largest Aboriginal culture block in Australia. If you're from Australia and you know more about that, then I'd welcome you to correct me in the comments. It's so weird that all over the world, these cultures used to talk about little people that would make people disappear. I didn't even mean to fan that by the way, I had no idea that the natives talked about this, or I'd have included it in the Hidden People video. In any case, just out of curiosity, and briefly, this is how the natives describe the bullet. He's a little hairy man, about two feet high. He's a devil. He will take the children. They must not go out after dark, after 4pm. Right, in any case, let's stop getting sidetracked and have a more in-depth look at what happened to Philip Grainer. At this time, one of the best known carriers engaged on the Cooktown Palmer River route was a man named Philip Grainer. One evening, during July of 1872, he was on his way to the Palmer River with a pack horse team loaded with provisions. He camped with some other carriers near the Black Mountain. That night, however, 
three of his horses broke loose and galloped away in the direction of the mountain. At daybreak the next morning, Grainer mounted another horse and set out to search for the missing animals. He made straight for the mountain and was never seen again. When Grainer had not returned to the camp after three hours, the other carriers who were preparing to resume their respective journeys became alarmed. Three of them rode towards the mountain shouting Philip's name. There was no response to their calls however. They had barely reached the foot of the grim pile of granite slabs when they saw Grainer's saddled horse grazing contentedly nearby. The article then goes on to explain that there was no sign of Philip at all, and despite a thorough search, he was never found. The following day, a large police presence and Aboriginal trackers descended on the mountain to search for Philip, but they too couldn't find a trace of him. It's said that one of the Aboriginal trackers had said, it's as if the earth had opened up and swallowed him whole. It looks like it wasn't only the mountain that was scoured, but miles and miles around the area too. Again, the natives started talking about how this was the work of the Devil Devil. I was hoping to find some information from the natives themselves, specifically just what they had to say about the mountain. ABC had spoken to one of the indigenous peoples there called Mary Shipton. This is what she had to say. As a small child, Mary was taught to respect the site and gets angry when tourists enter without permission or guidance. It's hard to tell them, they want to discover the country but they don't know what's really there. A lot of people don't respect our culture. We see a lot of non-indigenous people. They think they know about sacred sites, but they should show respect to indigenous people by not walking on their country. For me, it's a sacred site and no one is allowed to go to that area. If they do, they will get very, very sick. I feel bad about it. They're heading straight into bad vibes there. So it's clear to see that the native peoples there ascribe disappearances and other negative events on the mountain to the more unusual side of things. ABC also spoke to another man there called Harold Ludwig, who I believe is indigenous too. He said, In our Boris, spirits appear to us. It's not just a fairy tale, it's real. You see these things come to you. It's quite difficult to find specific information about this mountain. For example, what I was really interested in knowing was just how many people visit the National Park annually. I thought this might be interesting because I can't for the life of me find any recent disappearances in the area or anything like that, which is a good thing in all fairness. I can only seem to find these incidents that took place around and well over a hundred years ago now. What I did come to realise though is that Australia's Black Mountain isn't the only mountain with that name that is also associated with disappearances. This next disappearance was reported on the 30th of November 1908 and occurred on the Black Mountain, only not in Australia, but rather in Virginia in the United States. And with a title like that, who isn't interested in hearing more? Within less than half a century, many persons have been swallowed up in the deep ravines of the Black Mountain in Wise County, Virginia, never to be found again. The old mountain carries many strange secrets, says the New York Times. Many have ridden into its shadows only for the eternal gates of silence closing noiselessly behind them. The region is inhabited by mountain people who are a law unto themselves. Few men have ever ventured alone into the mountain and come back to tell the tale. No explanation has ever been given as to what became of those who disappeared, nor how the manner in which those whose bodies have been recovered managed to pass away. The Seymour Daily Republican then makes the point that the general public at the time weren't really aware of the disappearances that were happening until a guy named Edward Lysenring Wentz disappeared in the area. Edward was a young millionaire from Philadelphia, and while it's not clear what he was doing that day, we know that he disappeared on the 14th of October 1904. That morning, he took his favourite horse and travelled to the Black Mountain area, and this would be the last time that he would ever be seen as he never returned that evening, and this prompted a search. The search did actually find Edward's horse pretty quickly, and that was on the same evening. His horse was found abandoned with the bridle and the saddle still on near the Powell's River, not far from the Roaring Fork, which apparently is the spot where several other missing men disappeared from. For weeks, hundreds of men scoured the mountains, hunting through every ravine and in every cave for some trace of the lost man. The impression gained credence that Wentz had been taken supposedly for the purpose of ransom, 
This led to the offering of a reward of $55,000 for his return. Stimulated by the offer of the reward, hundreds of bold men joined in the search. This supposed ransom demand never actually materialised, and people quickly began to realise that something else must have happened here. And the search continued for quite some time because of the promise of a reward. Exactly five months after the official search for Edward reached its inconclusive conclusion, his body was actually found by a mountaineer who happened by it. He said that it was an odd sight, and that Wentz was lying peacefully in a lonely spot among fallen trees. Edward's body, unfortunately, was in a state of decay, and it was impossible to determine a cause of passing, but no obvious injuries or anything like that was ever reported. We might have had more luck with today's tech, but back then, from what I understand, it was much more difficult to determine a diagnosis when in this context of uh, decay. Locals wanted answers as to what had happened here, but unfortunately, all they were left with was speculation. Some believed that this was intentional and that Edward purposely went up there to be at peace. Others made the argument that he wouldn't have just abandoned his favourite horse, which he seemed to be very fond of, and left it with its saddle still on. In the end though, it's not actually clear what happened to Edward, or how the initial massive search managed to miss him. The Seymour Daily Republican ended with this. The daily papers carried columns of well-written theories attempting to explain in some plausible manner the means and the cause of the passing of Wentz. But the secret lay hidden in the recesses of the rocky hills and there were none so bold to go and look for it. It was then realised that over half a dozen men had disappeared in the same area as Edward over the course of the years, but only Edward's body had been discovered. The Seymour Daily Republican explains, all of the supposed victims of the mountains had ventured into the wild region where the mad waters of Roaring Creek leap and pitch down the rugged mountain ravine over shagged rocks to pour into the more quiet stream known as Powell's River. After the discovery of Edward's body, people began talking about a man who disappeared under unusual circumstances before him, James B. Gearhart. James was a Bristol insurance man who ventured out to the mountains, only to never return. The article explains, The disappearance of Gearhart is as much a mystery now as when the searchers were peering fearfully into the ravines searching for him. He left at his lodging quarters in Bristol a valuable library, a wardrobe full of valuable clothing and other personal property. These effects have remained unclaimed to this day. James was apparently staying at a hotel in Appalachia on business. It seems he was inspecting the mining areas of the region. One morning, he set off to the Black Mountain and took the route which led the way of Roaring Fork and near Powell's River, which happened to be the place where the others are thought to have disappeared. That was the last ever seen of Gearhart. Inquiry has been made in every part of the country, but no trace has ever been found of the missing man. Now you can probably guess what I'm about to say, but all of the searches for James ended in failure and no conclusions have ever been drawn as to what happened to him or the other men in the area. Years after these prior incidents, the former congressman, James B. Richmond of Gate City, relayed an interesting event that happened to him at the Black Mountain that held a parallel to Wentz and Gearhart. The occurrence in question took place just prior to the Civil War. Two men were searching for a herd of lost cattle in the wilds of the mountain region. When they came to the fatal spot near the mouth of Roaring Fork, they dismounted and hitched their horses in order to reach points that were inaccessible while mounted. They separated at the gorge, taking separate ridges in the ascent, having agreed to return and meet at the mouth of the gorge within a specified time. Only one of these men ever followed the backwards trail. He waited in vain and called repeatedly for his companion. Finally, as the shades of night began to fall, he mounted and rode away from the lonely spot alone. Search was made for the missing man immediately thereafter. From that day to this, and in the meantime, many other men have walked out of the world of men through the same rocky gorge. No trace of him has ever been discovered. Another incident was relayed too, in which the authorities had gotten wind of moonshiners somewhere in the area, and a group of revenue officers went to seek them out. They eventually decided to search the Black Mountains specifically, but all of them vanished there and not a single one returned. The authorities weren't sure what had happened and started an investigation into the incident. Some locals believed that the moonshiners got them and others believed that there were sinister forces at work 
and then they cite the previous incidents and history of the mountain. The federal government themselves took an interest in this and poured some resources into the search, and they expanded the available manpower. However, and as quoted from the article, the mountain remained silent. The searchers never found anything to give any kind of clue as to what might have happened to the officers. There were some that reasoned that they didn't believe that the moonshiners would have done this, even if they were operating in the area, because doing this has now attracted massive attention and, you know, put a target on the back. What is interesting is that the dogs never found a scent either, which I suppose could indicate that the officers might have been moved off the mountain or to another area entirely, you know, just buried somewhere far away from the actual search radius. Unfortunately, a time frame wasn't given here, but afterwards, a young mining engineer called Walter Kemp and Thomas Kilgore, who was the superintendent of the miners, disappeared on the Black Mountain. The locals used to say that they were immune to the mountain's evils because they would traverse it quite a lot. Well, that apparently wasn't the case because when they made this journey together up the Roaring Fork one day, they both disappeared and they never made it to their destination. The story becomes quite familiar now in that again, search parties were dispatched to the area once more, but like all the other incidents, they never found a hint of anything. No bodies were ever recovered, no clothes, no equipment, just no trace at all was found. And I'm sure you can imagine the rumours and superstitions that this was then brewing in the local communities. Right, just thematically at this point, I came across another Black Mountain, though this time much closer to me in the UK. Now I'm from the north of England, but there is one in Wales, and I came across an interesting article that highlights an incident in which a person went missing, but thankfully was found. I thought that this would be an interesting one to go through because it can act as a reminder of just how careful and prepared you've got to be because Mother Nature sometimes just has it in store for people. This incident happened in March of this year and was reported by the South Wales Guardian on the 5th of March. The woman who this happened to wanted to remain anonymous, but we know that she was around 50 years old. She's considered an experienced hiker who's very familiar with the Black Mountain and the surrounding areas too. She likes to take a dog for walks there and this time was no different, except it was and basically everything that could go wrong did in fact go wrong. What was supposed to be a quick dog walk turned into a bit of a nightmare on the Black Mountain. This person normally carries a bag with her that holds various supplies that are useful for longer hikes, so she has a power bank, food and water, things like this. This time though, thinking she was only going to be there for a short while, she didn't take those things with her. So she parked in a familiar place and began hiking the route that she's covered countless times. Now as she was ascending, a torrent of awful weather came her way, with powerful winds and heavy rain. This is what she said. I tried to turn back to the car, but the wind physically knocked me over. This happened a few times and totally disoriented me. Then the rain started and it was hitting my face like heavy projectiles. I was trying to get back to the car, but I just couldn't find it. After a while, we hit a boggy area, which I knew from previous walks was nowhere near the car. That's when I realized we weren't going to get back. At this point, just after entering the boggy area, she was surrounded by a thick fog and by 6pm that day, she couldn't see any more than a few metres around her. She then called for help, and I don't think I've ever mentioned this app before on the channel, but it can be a great survival tool if there's phone service in the area. It's called What Three Words, and I have this app myself. Just for those that don't know, what this app does is that it gives every three square metres of the world a combination of three unique words. The idea is that you open the app and then you see your three words and then you tell the authorities your location based off the words. I'm not sponsored or anything like that obviously. I don't really like doing sponsorships because it just feels like selling out to be honest. It just feel like, hey, here's this horrible thing that happened, but for a limited time only, you can play Raid Shadow Legends. You'd be shocked at how many offers I've had to promote that and honestly, how they've come to the conclusion that that would be appropriate is beyond me. Tangent aside, this app is great because what tends to happen when people call the emergency services is that they can't adequately describe where they are. So the emergency services are left with this problem where they're guessing where you might be and obviously this then wastes time and could potentially make the situation more dangerous for the person in trouble and for the people trying to find them. Of course, the app does have its limitations. You know, if there isn't a signal in the area, then it's not gonna be any help. Though I suppose it will register the location up until the point that there was no signal. So it could still help rescuers land closer to you. Though of course, I know that there might be uh, privacy issues for some, and they might not like that I suppose it literally tracks your location, but it might be a good idea to just, every time you're going out to download it, and then maybe uninstall it when you're done in the wilderness area or something like that. 
but I leave that to you. I'm sure you know what's better for you than I do. In any case, that situation is exactly what happened to our protagonist here, and unfortunately at some point during this, let's call it unsuccessful hike, she lost a phone signal. And so her three words no longer corresponded to her actual location, sending rescuers in the wrong direction. Here's how she described the ordeal. I was hunkered down in a hull to protect myself from the elements. I got up every few minutes so I didn't get hypothermia and shouted hello in case anyone was around. I couldn't see a thing. Everything below was pitch black and above from thick fog. I phoned 999 again to tell them I was still where I'd said I was. They sent a link to find my GPS location, but my phone just wouldn't load it. I checked the What Three Words app again and realized I was in a completely different place to where they thought I was. Then the phone cut. After the call cut out, she received another call from Mountain Rescue and then her phone died. Realizing this wasn't a good situation to be in, she tried moving out into a more open area to be more visible, but the visibility was so poor that she gave it up. She had unfortunately fallen over a few times now while wandering around that she ended up on her back on the grass and she thought that that was just going to be the end of it right there and then. She said that she kept hearing odd noises that she wasn't familiar with and then she saw lights in the distance. I grabbed the dog and just started running towards it. By that point I was screaming and shouting and suddenly there were more lights. One of their torches had caught a flash from the dog's eyes, otherwise they wouldn't have seen me. Thankfully, her and her dog made it out safely, but it does just go to show how careful you've got to be. This is an area that she was completely familiar with, and yet it all went bad wrong still, you know? She did have a little reflection on the incident, and she said, The whole time I was thinking, why didn't I bring my bag? It's the biggest mistake I've ever made. I was like one of those idiots I shout at on the news for climbing in their flip-flops. It will never ever happen again and I forever will be grateful to the police and volunteers who put their lives at risk to save mine. If anyone takes anything from my story, please let it be that they won't make the same mistake I did. I'm just thankful that she made it out of that situation relatively unscathed and with an important lesson learned too. I think we'll end this one here with that piece of sound advice from this lady and I'll hand it over to you in the comments. I'd just like to take a moment to thank you for watching and a special thank you to all of the patrons as well for all of your support. I appreciate it very much. If you found the video interesting, then please do hit the like button. And if not, then feel free to give it a thumbs down. I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. With all of that said, I hope that you've had a great day or evening depending on where you are. And I'll see you in the next one. Be safe, guys. Peace.